The story of David and Michael can be found in the book of 1 Samuel. Michael was David's first wife and the daughter of King Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. She is introduced as Saul's younger daughter. 1 Samuel chapter 14 verse 49 Now Saul's sons were Jonathan, Ishuai, and Melchishua. The names of his two daughters were these. The name of the firstborn was Mirab, and the name of the younger, Michael. Her father, Saul, is one of the Bible's disappointments. At 30 years old, Saul ascended to the throne with great promise. It didn't take long for Saul's personal and spiritual flaws to surface, to his detriment and the detriment of Israel. He was impatient and impulsive, making poor decisions under duress, and then attempting to justify himself rather than admit his mistakes. Her brother Jonathan was a brave soldier like his father, and would eventually become David's friend, protector, and advocate in Saul's court. Michael's soon-to-be husband David was a shepherd and musician in his youth and was known for playing the harp. He played for her dad, King Saul, before being promoted as his armor bearer. David came to national prominence in Israel when he slew the Philistine giant Goliath, an event that resulted in a major military victory. As David kept winning battles, Saul grew increasingly jealous. He was furious when he heard women singing songs praising David's accomplishments more than his own. Twice, the king tried to personally kill David, but both times David escaped. Then Saul made him captain over a thousand soldiers, perhaps hoping that David would be killed while fighting the Philistines it appears that he had formerly held a larger command. As a result of David's exploits, all Israel took notice of him. As Saul's older daughter, Mirab, had been promised to the man who would kill the Philistine giant, David was offered her. However, more victories would have to be won first. Saul hoped David would be killed in the process. When David expressed his social unworthiness to be a son-in-law to the king, Mirab was given to another man, which was perhaps Saul's way of trying to humiliate David. It is here we see the relationship between Michael and David. 1 Samuel chapter 18 verses 20 through 21. Now Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. And when they told Saul, it pleased him. Saul said, I will give her to him so that she may become a snare, bad influence, source of trouble to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So Saul said to David for a second time, You shall be my son-in-law today. Saul agreed to give her to David, provided he produced a dowry of 100 Philistine foreskins. Again, Saul hoped to kill David by the hand of the Philistines, but David was not to be eliminated so easily. He returned with a bizarre dowry in double measure and won Michael as his bride. As continual military success made it clear that the Lord was with David, Saul's hatred and fear of him continued to grow. Michael and David seemed to have a great relationship at first. Like her brother Jonathan, Michael had occasion to protect David from her father's attempts on his life. When Saul sent men to kill David, Michael helped David escape through a window, and she covered for him with a story that he was sick. She afterwards claimed David had threatened to kill her if she didn't help him. After Saul died in a battle against the Philistines, David was wed to Michael. The curse of Michael concerns David's bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. The Philistines previously captured the Ark of the Covenant. After being brought back to Israel, the Ark was kept at kiriath Jerum. David had a desire to relocate the Ark to Jerusalem. 
King David decided to bring the Ark of God to Jerusalem. David investigated the scriptures to see how the Ark was to be transported. Afterward, the Ark was brought to a temporary tent in the city of David, and there were people dancing in the streets. The king was overjoyed and danced before the Lord with all his might. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 14 through 23. And David was dancing before the Lord with great enthusiasm. And David was wearing a linen ephod, a priest's upper garment. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing the ark of the Lord up to the city of David with shouts of joy and with the sound of the trumpet. Then as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, David's wife, looked down from the window above and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she felt contempt for him in her heart because she thought him undignified. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent which David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts, armies, and distributed to all the people, the entire multitude of Israel, both to men and women, to each a ring-shaped loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people departed, each to his house, then David returned to bless his household. But his wife Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious and distinguished was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself and stripped off his kingly robes in the eyes of his servants' maids like one of the riffraff who shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michael, It was before the Lord that I did this, who chose me above your father and all his house, to appoint me as ruler over Israel, the people of the Lord. Therefore I will celebrate in pure enjoyment before the Lord. Yet I will demean myself even more than this, and will be humbled, abased in my own sight, and yours as I please. But by the maids whom you mention, by them I shall be held in honor. Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. David realized that genuine worship is meant solely for God. We don't worship to impress others, but rather to humbly respond to God. We read, David danced before the Lord with all his might. David didn't hold back anything in his own expression of worship. He didn't dance out of obligation, but out of heartfelt worship. He was glad to bring the Ark of the Lord into Jerusalem according to God's word. We don't think that dancing is strange when the baseball player rounds the bases after the game-winning home run or the winning goal is scored. We don't think it is strange when our own child scores a goal. We think nothing at hands raised at a concert or touchdown. We should not think them strange in worship to God. David's wife, Michael, didn't appreciate David's exuberant worship. She felt it wasn't dignified for the king of Israel to express his emotions before God. With biting sarcasm, Michael's criticism could have ruined this whole day for David. Michael seemed to indicate that she didn't object to David's dancing but to what David wore when he set aside his royal robes and danced as a man just like the other men, celebrating in the procession. David acted as if he were just another worshiper in Israel. David didn't let Michael's sarcastic criticism ruin his day. He simply explained the truth. I did it for God, not for you. David responded by contrasting two pursuits, people-pleasing versus God-pleasing. He told her, 
it was before the Lord that I danced. Therefore I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and will be humble in my own sight. God-pleasing leaders can learn three important things from David. First, sacrifice. David made many sacrifices en route to Jerusalem. Second, surrender. David danced and shouted with reckless abandon before the Lord. Third, service. David gave food generously to all in Israel. David's actions were humbling, as he did not dance to display his spirituality to others. Michael's barrenness was not necessarily the result of divine judgment. Nevertheless, the principle stands. There is often barrenness in the life and ministry of the overly critical. What began as a celebrity marriage in Israel involved a series of dramatic events that ultimately led to David choosing multiple wives. Michael chose to speak against her husband and went through her life childless. Though David was a man after God's own heart, his marriage relationships were problematic. Through David and Michael's relationship, God worked despite their sinful nature, and the Lord likewise calls us today to live for Him despite past failures to pursue His direction for our lives. David's wife Michael worried far more about image than authenticity. When David danced before the Lord, she felt ashamed of him. She wanted to guard her family's reputation and remain oh so sophisticated. But we wind up with shallow spirits when we focus on appearance rather than substance. Unlike Michael, David was a man after God's own heart. One would think that a man who gives praise is absent of worries and challenges, but this is not true. He's often called the sweet psalmist of Israel. But was this always true? I would like you to know that this lovely man experienced bitter times. The Bible says that David's daily routine included praising God seven times. This means whether he was in a great mood or weary from his assignments, he always made time to appreciate and honor God. No wonder he was a man after God's heart. We see him in various verses praising, rejoicing, and joyful before the Lord, even when he was facing challenges. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. O oh, taste, and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Psalm chapter 34 from these verses, it's evident that David is going through terribly challenging times. There was fears, troubles, crying, and no doubt he must have fainted. Yet, he found it in his heart to praise and rejoice before the Lord. Of course, this is why God's power was always powerfully revealed to him, and he was delivered repeatedly. When faced with challenges, 
The typical reaction is to moan or complain about the situation. Pondering on these enormous and overwhelming challenges only brings discouragement and can lead to depression because what we magnify will always look bigger than it is. Our state of mind enlarges these issues so much that they engulf our every waking moment. They affect not only our normal reactions, but also our self-esteem. Part of why David is called a man after God's own heart is that he had absolute faith in God. Through David's consistent meditation practice, God bestowed understanding and wisdom upon him. Because God delights in it when we give him our thoughts, we would do well to read the Bible and think about what it says as the day goes on. There were times in David's life when he was filled with fear and despair, and there were also times when he was filled with great peace and prosperity. But despite the many changes in his life, he never stopped to forget to thank the Lord for everything he possessed. It is without question one of David's most admirable qualities. It would benefit us as followers of Jesus Christ to follow David's example and offer praise and thanksgiving to our Lord in the same way he did. Praise, thanksgiving, joy and rejoicing are extremely potent weapons to use because victory is assured no matter the intensity of the battle. Psalm number 22, verse 3. But you are holy. O you who are enthroned in the holy place where the praises of Israel are offered. We must therefore face whatever comes before us with confident assurance and praise for the victories we desire. Let us pray. My dear Father, thank you because you have made provisions for me to triumph, no matter what confronts me. I ask for your help, so I will not allow the enemy to weaken my faith by using my mind to magnify my challenges. Please, give me the grace to praise you, even when I am fainting, because that is how I win my battle. May all the praise and glory be to you. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Amen.